Prime Minister, could I ask you maybe to join us here on the stage, and I'll welcome back as well uh, Noel Collins. Um, we have a few minutes left just to tease out a few final points. Just uh, that last survey question about what activities, in your opinion, should the uh, EA prioritise in the immediate future. Not surprising that uh, the results are 12% say focus on ensuring buyers are compliant with their obligations, 15% saying focus on uh, ensuring uh, suppliers are aware of their rights, but 73% say that both these issues should be prioritised. Um, Noel, can I just go back to you first? I'm wondering, what is the cost to, uh, of unfair trading practices to the entire agri-food supply chain on an annual basis? Have you been able to calculate that? It's a great question, uh, Damien, um, and it's something we haven't really been able to get a handle on heretofore until the survey. What the survey has done that's really interesting uh, is we've taken a baseline perception on what that cost might be. So one of the questions Bernie's team asked the primary producers is, uh, we give them the list of the 16 UTPs and said, well, what is it for those that were impacted, which is about 25% of them or 1,800 uh, suppliers, we asked them, what was the cost to you, economic cost? And they said it was about 3.3% of their turnover. Exact same question to the B2B suppliers. They said 1.6% of their turnover. Now, if you, now, these important that these are perceptions. So if you extract, extrapolate those numbers to national based on CSO stats, turnover of the food and drinks sector nationally is about 26 billion. 1.6% uh, of that is about 400 million. So that gives you 100, uh, it's in the hundreds of millions. Primary producers, we know CSO stats output is approximately 9.5 billion for the last full year. So we're looking at about a 300 million number there. So we're talking about hundreds of millions. And those figures aren't outliers because in the EU impact assessment, it was referenced to 2017 survey of EU suppliers and it found a weighted average of the economic cost was between 1.5 and 1.8 percent of turnover. So it very much highlights it's a European phenomenon and our numbers are very much aligned with that. So a big economic cost. Do you have to wait for a complaint before commencing an investigation? No, uh, we have the powers to commence investigations on our own initiative, uh, uh, Damien, and we will do that based on evidence. So part of that evidence will be implementation reports, which allow us to do inspections, and in the course of finding inspections, which will be based on evidence in terms of identifying where the various risks are, if we find there's potential breaches, then it will be escalated into investigations, but it's not exclusive to implementation reports. We have other market intelligence. Uh, we could receive a number of confidential complaints that the supplier may be fearful to come forward, but if a number of those complaints are all about the same entity, it'll tell us there's a problem and we can use that evidence to take forward uh, progress investigations. So, no, we don't have to wait uh, for a complaint to come. Yeah, Minister, just how do you, what do you say to farmers and small suppliers now uh, going, uh, going forward um, who up until now have had this fear of making a complaint um, for fear that they'd be ostracised or that there'd be re re uh, retaliation of, of some description? It's a very, very important point and that farmers and small suppliers must have confidence now in um, UTP and in the Ombudsman in the future to protect them? Yeah, I think it's the biggest challenge we have. And, and I mean, the research and the discussion here today very much speaks to that, whether it's the poll that was conducted among those participating or indeed the research that, that Bernie did. And, um, you know, that's not something we're going to tackle very easily, but I think it's something where we're going to have to gain people's confidence. And I think the two ways to do that, first of all, is, is to communicate and get the message out there in terms of the protections that are now in place. Uh, the role of the Unfair Trading Practices Enforcement Authority currently, and also the role that the new Office for Fairness and Transparency will have. So communicating to farmers exactly what that's about, the protection it can give, but then also by virtue of the work that it carries out, gaining that confidence too. And I think key in terms of how we communicate that is emphasizing the absolute importance of confidentiality, because you know whenever you're trying to address something which is about uh, someone feeling weaker in the food supply chain, someone feeling vulnerable in it, then they're in a challenging position and obviously concern mm -hmm. and fear around implications and retaliation um, is, is something that they're going to be very much aware of. And, so and it's something we're going to have to work Will investigation results, will they on. be published? S sorry, David. Will the investigation results be published? You know, or, or I detailed? Can that, no, I, I can that. take that one. So, yeah, it's very clear under regulations. We have very strong powers of publishing, and I, we think that's one of the strongest deterrents, uh, Damien. Uh, we're actually required in our annual report to publish the results of any open or closed investigations. But interestingly, the directive gives very strong powers around publishing. That's not unusual in terms of enforcement. 
um, regulatory authorities in that where the enforcement authority uh, initiates proceedings, initiates legal proceedings against a buyer for a breach of regulations, we can publish that. We don't have to wait for the outcome of court proceedings. If we've issued a compliance notice to a, uh, a buyer that has breached the regulations uh, and we've taken uh, um, legal proceedings, we can publish that. So we have very strong powers of publishing. Okay. Minister, you've opened a public consultation in relation to the appointment of a food ombudsman. Um, how is that going to dovetail with Noel's office? Yeah, well, so uh, the, we, we did, and the, there was a really, really good response to it. So what we've been doing now over the last period of time is actually collating all of the different perspectives and uh, um, intelligence that has been garnered from that um, and, and forming that into the legislation. I, I plan now to very shortly publish the legislation um, and to bring it through the doll over, this, over the course of this in advance of the summer. And also in parallel to that then as well, commence the recruitment process for the new full-time office of... Uh, um, and the staff, and this, starting with the CEO of the new uh, Office for Fairness and Transparency. So then, as it comes towards, and I hope to have that up and running by the end of this year, uh, and then as Noel outlined in his presentation, it'll be about transferring over the work, the really important work which has been outlined this morning, which Noel and all the team ha ha have carried out, transferring that into that office and, and handing that over, and also then looking at how we um, uh, enable that new office to engage in terms of the, 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 the softer things which can make a real difference um, in terms of engaging throughout the food supply chain. Because I think what we've seen, particularly over the last few weeks and months, and particularly since the invasion of, illegal invasion of uh, atrocious illegal invasion of Ukraine, um, has been um, the importance of the engagement throughout the supply chain, uh, the relationships being able to respond to what the real challenges are and the changes in the marketplace. Um, and too often what we see is that it's the farmer, the primary producer that also ultimately, and, and the smaller producers and smaller suppliers that have to carry that pain. Right. And you know, we need to ensure that in terms of the engagement throughout, throughout the supply chain that that can be, that that, that can be shared. Uh, and ultimately the importance of, of primary producers having a fair margin and a fair income is respected. Because if you don't have a situation where there's sustainability, economic sustainability throughout the supply chain, you don't have a healthy supply chain, and, and it's not one that works properly. All right, I just want to introduce, the, um, if you have questions from the floor here, I'll try and get to a couple of them. Just if, the, if people have their hands up, if you can bring the microphone to them, I'll try my best to get to everybody. Um, and if we don't, don't, don't shoot me. Anyway, uh, just one more slide. How reassured are you that unfair trading practices in the food supply chain will be tackled in the future? This is a Slido question for you at home. Are you very reassured, somewhat reassured, unsure, not reassured, or not at all uh, reassured. So just for those of you online, how reassured are you that unfair trading practices in the food supply chain will be tackled in the future? And I'll have a result for that at the very end. Okay, do we have a question? Microphone Hello. here, yeah, where are we? Sorry, it's just with the, you're up the back uh, there. Yeah, if you'd I, like to introduce yourself and yeah. just direct your question. Speak. I'm the uh, chairman of the uh, IFA Poultry Committee. Um, delighted to hear what this proposal, but more concerned, will it include the, the uh, prohibitation of below cost selling? Um, we have a situation where poultry farmers are being paid less than what's costing to produce some of their products at the moment. And the other question will it be on labelling. If it's not an Irish chicken in the bag, will it be illegal to say that it's an Irish chicken? Okay, Minister, below cost selling, I don't know who wants to take that, that question, just will below cost selling be prohibited? in the bill for the new office? Uh, no, I, I don't plan to, below, to, to ban below cost selling in that. What, what I want to achieve is a situation whereby primary producers are respected and the need for a fair income and a proper income for primary producers uh, is, is central to the food supply chain. Low cost selling was in place up to whatever it was, the early noughties, and it was, it was removed at that stage because it was felt not to be effective in actually achieving its objective. Um, so obviously the, the objective behind it was to initially was to, to, produ to, to protect primary producers, um, but the reality of how it was actually working was found not necessarily to be doing that, because of course whether whatever the price that something has been sold for on the shelf does not necessarily change the relationship between the retailer and those who are buying it off, or in terms of how the, the interaction happens between them, or how the competition happens between them. It could actually only have the impact, for example, 
of improving the margins that are available for the actual retailer or potentially the processor, but not necessarily improve the margin that is there for the primary producer, because you're still going to have very significant competitive um, um, pressures whereby they will seek to get the lowest price possible potentially from the primary producer. So the fa the, 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 while it may sound simple uh, in terms of saying if you ban, ban below cost selling, um, that doesn't mean that, um, that, that, that it, it, it applies or requires a margin for the primary producer. And that's what we want to achieve here. Having tried below cost selling and having had it part of how our country <coughs> operated, the experience was that actually what it did was it added more red tape and more cost ultimately to the consumer because it was costly to administer, um, difficult to administer as well, but didn't actually result in the primary producer getting a better margin. Right. And no one ha I have seen no one come forward or explain to me a process as to how that would impact in relation to primary producers getting a better margin. And ultimately, anything I want to do here is about ensuring that primary producers are, are protected. Okay. And, and, and just one final, point, one final point as well, Damien, then. Because of the fact that 90%, 90% of everything and all the work that our farmers do inside the farm gate, 90% of that food is sold abroad. We're an export, exporting nation. That's why our sector is so fantastic and why it creates so much employment. But ultimately, it means in terms of the milk, the beef, and the lamb, etc., that we are selling um, or the, that, that, it, that it is sold abroad into international markets. And it's those international markets which determine the end price in, on international restaurants or in international supermarkets. So therefore, the capacity, even if we had price setting potential within the country, um, you're still talking about only 10% of the total overall okay. produce. So what we really need to do is ensure that the relationship and the respect that's there for the primary producer is key to those relationships. And that's what I think the new office needs to focus on and try and achieve. OK, and just briefly on labelling. I mean, that is a contentious issue as well. has been for many years, mislabeling. And uh, Absol yeah, is, no, is that going to be covered at all? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we have strict labelling laws in the country as it is. Um, and it's crucial that there's absolute clarity there okay. in relation to the, the produce that, 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 that customers are buying. Um, and any way we can work to ensure that that becomes clearer and more transparent, absolutely, I'd be full square behind. We have another question, I think, up here, yep. Sorry, yeah. Just in relation to the office, uh, will it be adequately resourced? Uh, we can see from Noel's answer there of the, the cost of, of this uh, unfair uh, trading. Uh, and my second question is in relation to uh, the actual, I suppose, evidence needed in order for uh, an investigation to take place. We can see from the results that there's unlikelihood of, of suppliers to come forward. Okay, so if, if evidence is needed, what's the likelihood of, of investigation starting? Okay, and I suppose that's, uh, will there be on, on the spot okay. inspections where evidence isn't gathered in order to have an investigation? Okay, so how much evidence will you need? I don't know, do you want to take that note before? I'll, I'll take the inspection point. Uh, so yeah, it's, you know, uh, our investigation point, like investigations are uh, a resource intensive exercise, but I wouldn't use investigation as a sole metric for success. If you look at the UK GCA model, you know, there are very few investigations over seven years, but the scene is highly effective. What we believe is the best way to address it is developing the culture and compliance. That's why we're being proactive. That's why we're meeting the largest entities and engaging with them. But that doesn't mean we can't do on spot, and we have the powers to do on the spot in, or no notice on site inspections. And we will use that if we think it's appropriate. Uh, we have very strong powers in that. Uh, and we won't be afraid to do investigations either, uh, but it, clearly they'll have to be evidence-based. The law is the law. Uh, a buyer has a legal right to defence, and there has to be clear evidence presented to us as an enforcement authority that a potential breach has occurred. We can't just go out there uh, uh, and be almost like white in, mm -hmm. with uh, businesses. We have to have evidence that bre breaches are, uh, may be occurring before we can take escalated action. And we'd be very happy to receive that from any impact. Okay, suppliers. and resourcing and staffing? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the resources are going to be really important for it. And we're kicking off now with the uh, recruitment of a CEO initially and then other staff and after that. And certainly in terms of the staffing that's going to require them, determined to ensure that it's properly resourced so that it can perform effectively. Question? Yeah, 
Uh, thanks, Eddie Hunch from the Irish Cattle and Sheep Farm Association. Um, Minister, how are you going to ensure the office has enough power to deliver on the transparency agenda in terms of who gets what from the food chain? Because, as we know, that has been a, a source of a lot of frustration amongst farmers. And second question is, for the primary producer who doesn't deal directly with a retailer, in other words, beef, dairy, etc., uh, how are they to be assisted by this office because their relationship is with a processor rather than a retailer? Yeah, and I, and I think for the, what's going to be really important there, Eddie, is, is shining a light and bringing transparency uh, to the supply chain and having an office that has the independence and the credibility to assess what's happening, uh, to report on that, and therefore to put pressure on and apply pressure and have the have the independence and the credibility um, and carry the weight to be actually able to influence as a result of that too, with the objective of ensuring that the primary producer is respected. Um, as they, for 90% of our produce, and um, you know, it's, it's different pigs, for example, it's 50% 50, 50 for the domestic market, uh, and poultry is a higher percentage for the domestic market too, but across the board, on average, 90% of what we produce is exported. So you're really looking, and the market is set by what's available internationally in the, the 140 markets we, we, we export to. And therefore, you know, well, that's why we do so much work. Um, and, you know, the role board B a play, for example, in terms of trying to uh, maximize the value gets in those markets, the real important work that the, the processing sector um, also do in relation to developing those markets. Um, but that's where the price is set. And what we need to be able to do then is trace that back and have an office, which and this doesn't exist at the moment. There isn't that capacity there have an office and, and, and somebody with the credibility and the capacity and the, uh, the, 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 the talent and, and abilities to be able to actually assess what's going on and then use their independence and credibility to pressurize, right. ultimately, protection of the primary consumer and ensure as much of that as possible is getting back to the, the farmer, fisher, or primary producer. And one final question. Yeah, thanks, Damien. And thanks, Minister, for the presentation this morning. But I just want to go back there. And, and there is four sectors here in Ireland that's to almost totally depending on the retail sector here is the pig poultry, the heart and the potato sector. And all of those sectors are under enormous pressure, as you know, at the moment. You know, we're suffering serious hyperinflation on, on the cost of production across all sectors at the moment. All sectors in agriculture at the moment. You know, over the last 10 years, we've seen deflation in the price of food. Deflation, now not inflation. Slight inflation recently. But you know, farmers are going out of business as I speak here at, at the moment. And I, I, I think that's very, very important. And you know, you did say in your comments there. And just you know, that, if you have a question. Yeah, 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 have yeah. A, I absolutely have Thanks. a question. But I just want to make that point. But my question is, you know, when is the legislation coming for pre-legislative scrutiny? You know, I think time is of the essence here. We need this immediately. You, know, you spoke about the end of the year. You know, I'd like to know when is it coming before the law? Thank you, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, th thanks, Tim. And uh, my plan is to have it through the DAW and through, through, through the legislative process by the summer, and also to commence the recruitment process now and in parallel with that as well, so that we can have the office up and running and functional by the end of the year. Um, and uh, you know, you're right, and we, we've engaged a lot, as I have, with ICMSA and, and, and ICSA and, and MACRA and INHFA over the last number of uh, months in relation to the challenge that's there, and particularly with yourself, uh, Tim, on, on on the, on the pig and, and the poultry side, the challenges there are coming from the input, input cost challenge. We've, we've done a number of responses in terms of the two support packages for pigs, the support package for uh, horticulture as well, um, to support them with the real difficult challenges that are there. But what we need to see, and what it's really brought home, is uh, we knew it already, but what it's really brought home even more to me is the absolute importance of a responsive supply chain, whereby the, uh, the different levels and the, the retail and the processing sector can actually respond to what's happening in relation mm -hmm. to cost impact. And that it's not left for the primary producer or the farmer, whether it's the, the, or the, 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 the vegetable grower or whatever, to be carrying all and to be, have, to, be, to, to be sailing close to the wind and to be endangering going out of business because of the fact that that's not, that that's not responsive. And, um, and you know, there will be a lot of focus, and we've tried below cost selling and banning that in the country before. But I mean, when, what really people, and what really we want to, achieve, if it was at all possible, is below cost buying. Um, and that's not something that you can legislate for. But it's below cost buying we want to stop. Okay. 
Um, you can't legislate for it, but we have to apply every possible tool we can to, to protect the primary producer and ensure that, the, that the, 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 the supply chain above that responds in a way that respects the role they have. Because what we've seen over the last few months is a lot of, is potentially a lot of our really core suppliers running the risk of going out of business and disappearing. You take the horticulture sector, vegetable growing, fruit growing, you know, that's so important from so many, we should, we need to, we have great capacity to do that, but we, we don't, we're not self-sufficient, um, and we're in danger of losing uh, many of the supplier growers that we have, and that's why we intervened with the, the support package, because we want to see them continue through that. But that has to be very much respected by all in the supply chain, and I see the role of this office as being important in calling that out and ensuring that they use the heft of that office to work within the supply chain to make sure that, the, that, that those suppliers are protected and that the, 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 the contracts that are in place are responsive enough and the protocols in place are responsive enough to ensure that they are, they are protected as well. Because it's nobody's interest. While people will try and squeeze and squeeze and bleed and bleed and go after profit margins, it's no good if those who are actually the foundation of the sector aren't protected okay. and haven't got a, a fair oh. living in it. All right, Minister, we're going to have to leave it there. We started a little bit late, so we've ended a little bit late. But I want to thank everybody for their attendance here this morning. Thank you uh, for joining us online as well and participating in our survey. That final result, how reassured are you? Uh, it should come back up there. How reassured are you uh, that unfair trading practices in the food supply chain will be tackled in the future? 69% say very reassured or somewhat reassured, and the other 31% unsure, not reassured, or not at all reassured. Thank you to all of our speakers and uh, people who presented here today. Thank you to everybody online and indeed to everybody uh, who came here today. Uh, the, Noel and his staff will be available after the seminar finishes for those of you here that have any further questions. And remember, utp.gov.ie for further details on um, what's going forward. And all of the presentations will be published there as well today. So thank you all very much. Uh, good morning, and we leave you be.